Last time we talked about how Jesus appeared to the disciples on the day of Easter, the day of resurrection, but one person wasn't there. Who knows who that person is? Thomas. Thomas, that's right. Did you know that Thomas's name um, in, in Greek, Tuma, um, there's, a, there's another word that sounds almost like it, that's Tama, which means twin. So they have a play of words, play of names, and they call him uh, Thomas the Twin. Um, we don't know if he really had a twin, but most likely he was doubtful. That's why he's called Doubting Thomas. Um, but today we'll find something else about him. If you remember last time we talked about how um, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and Jesus said, let's go to Jerusalem. And all the disciples said, you really want to go to Jerusalem? You almost got stoned there. Okay, and not talking about drugs. <laughs> but they said, you almost got stoned there. It's not Las Vegas, it's Jerusalem, Judea. And Jesus said, I have to go, it's my mission. I got to go there. And Thomas, being the doubtful person that he was, and I think he was a little bit more sarcastic than we would normally see him in the scriptures, he said, well, let's go with Jesus to Judea so we can all get killed. So today, one week later, one week after the resurrection, we find the ten disciples plus one, Thomas, again together in the room. The doors were closed according to John, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 28. And this promises to me to be a really a good lesson here, something that I'm excited about. Beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, or twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And in verse 25, so the other disciples, when they eventually saw Thomas come, probably the following day during the week. He said, hey, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, uh, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, which is the right side of Jesus, I'm not going to believe. Now notice this. He says, I doubt it. He doesn't say, I doubt it. He says, I will not believe. And sometimes we find ourselves in the same position. We may be followers of Jesus when we come to the place where we just can't believe it. Right? We just can't believe what's happening. We just can't believe the things that we've heard about. And here, Thomas says, I don't believe. I can't believe it. Well, unless I see it, right? What's, there's a state that says, show me, right? What's, what's the name of that state? Missouri. Missouri, right? And their motto is what? Show me. Show me, okay. I have to learn those different states. The only states I know are Nevada and California and Florida. <laughs> Those are the places I've lived in. Verse 26, after eight days, which would have been today, after Resurrection Day, eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors had been being shut, so you don't expect anyone to walk in, right? And Jesus stood in their midst and said, Shalom, peace be with you. Now, the title of this sermon is, When Jesus Walks In. And this, I'm beginning a new series here, a new mini-series, mini uh, entitled, The Risen Jesus. So this is the first one. Verse 27, Then Jesus said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving. Now the other uh, translations say don't doubt. But 
The New American Standard Bible says don't be unbelieving, and for a good reason, I think. But instead, be believing. Now, did, did the apostles tell Jesus about the incident with Thomas where he said, I'm not going to believe until I see the nails in the, the nail marks in his hands and on his side and I put my finger right there. Did they? Did they have any contact with Jesus between Easter and the eighth day that we're talking about now? Not at all, right? And yet Jesus walks in and knows everything about Thomas and what he said. Remember there was another disciple whom, whom Jesus met uh, at the beginning of his ministry. This guy was sitting under a sycamore tree and then who's that? What's that guy's name? Remember? Someone mentioned it. Nathaniel, right. An Israelite, an Israelite without any guy, he says. And because of that particular um, word that Jesus released to him, he believed that there's something with this guy, that I need to follow this guy. Thomas had been with Jesus for three and a half years. But he still couldn't seem to get in himself to believe exactly what Jesus was here for. Remember, Jesus was here as the Messiah. He was here to, sh to deliver a message about the kingdom, about the gospel. He was here to show the rest of the world, the world, exactly who the Father is. And during his mission, Thomas went with him, maybe three years, maybe three and a half years, we don't know exactly, but somehow, he didn't exactly believe that Jesus was the one who's going to save the world. Maybe Israel, maybe he expected Jesus to be, he'll be the king, he'll be the Messiah, and he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel, right? You agree with me? But, he couldn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. He could not believe that Jesus actually, he saw him die, maybe from afar. He was arrested and he was uh, beaten and then crucified and he probably saw him from afar. So, And he was buried, he died, and now what? Now he's not like us, but we know the scriptures, we know the story, but he was there in the first century. He didn't have any clue what was going to happen. Jesus told them, but he probably didn't believe. That's why at this point he says, until I see his hands and his side and I put my finger in there, I won't believe. But Jesus walks in and says, hey, I know what you just said several days ago. Look at my hands. Put your finger inside the nail marks and put it here, my side. And that prompted in verse 28, Thomas declared and said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Now it's just it's not just an expression that we have, like, oh my God. But it's actually a declaration of this is my Lord, this is my Messiah, this is my King, this is my God. Now when I was reading this in preparation for this message, I just suddenly realized, you know, this sounds very strikingly similar with another scripture that Paul wrote in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 to 25. See, Paul was giving instructions to the church in Corinth, and he said, when you gather together, don't all speak in tongues because nobody understands. And then an unbeliever walks into your room while you're all speaking in tongues. They say, you guys are a bunch of nuts. They're all crazy. I, don't, I can't understand what you guys are saying. 
But in verse 24 he says, But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all. And in verse 25, the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. I've seen this happen many times in course ministry. In conferences where I've heard people who have not met the speaker and the speaker says something that you know, touches their lives. I've had this experience in many sermons, you know, that the message actually touches your life. And it's like God is speaking to you. How many of you have had that experience? That where God is speaking to you through the message? Here's an example of how when Jesus walks in, He hears your, the cry of your heart, He knows what's going on in your mind, and He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Amen. And He can prepare you, and He can touch your heart, He can bring healing to the deepest hurts in your heart. Even with the things that we don't even know about ourselves. Right? Now like yesterday, we were having this meeting, open hearts meeting. And man, it was just so obvious when Jesus walked into the room because something got became opened up. We started talking about a certain issue that one of the people in the, the meeting had and, and so we were talking about it and then the Holy Spirit touched this person. And so what can we do? Jesus had an agenda which was not part of our program. He walks in, touches a person's life, and all we can do is put our hands to where his hands were. And so we ask the person, hey, can you sit in the middle, we'll pray for you. And so we pray for that person. And we just watch what the Holy Spirit did. We took part in it, we prayed, and we blessed that person. Now last night, my, my brother uh, uh, called me the, actually the, uh, two days ago and said, Hey, can you come over to our place? We'll just have a little get together. I said, Oh man, not on Saturday. <laughs> so I had to prepare for a sermon, you know, a message, and Greg might give me an F minus. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's a good friend. <laughs> and I was like, man, all right, I'll just go because, you know, you never know what God's going to do. Right? So I went there. My wife and I, we went there. And, of course, we had food. Filipinos don't gather without food. Yeah. And not just a little bit of food, we gather with a lot of food. Yeah. Like, we already had lunch over at the Williams place for the Open Arts community. We got there, and the first thing we did was... <laughs> you know, <laughs> we had a feast. Mm -hmm. So I said, we already had lunch. Mm. Have lunch. <laughs> so we ate. <laughs> and then we ate some more. Mm. And then about 6 o'clock, we ate again. <laughs> it was like 3 o'clock. Then we had lunch at what time? 11. And then at 3 we had lunch. And then at 6 we had dinner. <laughs> and we kept on eating. But the funny thing was, after, after having that dinner, my sister came, we were sitting out there in the um, patio, I think that's what you call it, patio. We were just sitting around, and she says, Hey, um, what's this thing about, uh, I think his question was about prophecy, right? Her question was about prophecy. So we, we talked about, I actually talked about this message. I, I figured she wasn't coming, so I said, I'll, I'll give her the sermon. <laughs> Now I, I was just amazed at what God was doing because I was preparing for the sermon. I thought I was preparing at home. God decided, oh, you're preparing in your sister's house. <laughs> so I sat there and I gave this message. Not, not as long as I did. 
Um, but we talked about this, we talked about First Corinthians, and I said, you know, and, and then I gave some examples of what I've seen in the past in ministry. Um, when God walks in and, and, and reveals the heart of a person and, and shares that, man, I go on and on with story after story after story. Um, but don't want to shock you. And so last night we talked about prophecy and then my other sister walks, walks into the patio and she sits down and says, well, so how do you hear God? She's Catholic. My sister attends Canyon Ridge. My brother-in-law just uh, baptized over at Canyon Ridge. The one who sang, saw me. So this sister of mine is Catholic. So how do you really know it's God? So we started talking, and, um, and the entire conversation was about trying to hear God. And then she asked, next thing she asked is, what do you mean born again? So we started talking about born again. So I quoted John chapter 3 and I explained Jesus' encounter with Nic Nicodemus. And I was like, man, this is like, whoa. Jesus walks into the patio. So it was just, it was just like a, something God wanted to show me some examples of something that I could share this morning. Yeah, this morning. And, and, and tell us about what God, God is actually way ahead of us. We just need to know where He's going so we can follow Him. God didn't call us so that He can follow us. God called us so we can follow Him. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we need to know what's God doing? Where is He sending us? And yesterday I was just like, oh man, I wish I could just go home. I was planning to tell my wife, let's go home at 6. <laughs> but then we had dinner. <laughs> and I was thinking, all right, uh, let's go home at 8. Because it was already 7.30 when I decided, let's go home at 8. <laughs> oh, you know what? The rest of the story didn't happen until, you know, close to 8. And so I was just sitting there. Oh, man, I can't leave at 8. <laughs> God was not finished. 8 o'clock came, 8.30 came, 9 o'clock came, 9.30 came before we were able to say, God's finished, now it's time to go home. <laughs> so we went home 9.30, got home 10, I think, right? And that's, I got home, I did this stuff so that I could make sure that we had these um, um, slides. Printed a program with a bulletin. And I looked at the clock, what? 11.30, I normally finish at 12.30, and here I am, 11.30, and I'm all done. I just, you know, lie down and pretend I'm going to sleep. I said, wow, when God works, you know, He can squeeze 1,000 years in one second. And that's exactly what He did yesterday. And I said, I thank God, man, I'm, I'm all finished. Earlier. And so this is the message. Verse 29, Jesus says to Thomas, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Oh, we don't see Jesus. We don't see him face to face. We don't see his actual physical appearance. But we see him in the spirit. We see the work of the Holy Spirit in the Spirit. We see the effect of the Holy Spirit when He gives rebirth to a person. Just like the wind. We don't see the wind, but there's the effect. We see that. We see when a person receives that regeneration, when a person receives that renewal, when a person is revived, we see that. We can tell. Verse 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, the book of the Gospel of John. But these have been written so that you may believe. See, we're a people of doubt. And it's just normal for us to doubt. But sometimes in different areas of our lives, we have unbelief. And God wants to touch that. 
there's a story of that one person when 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 Jesus asked him, Do you believe? I believe, he says, but help my unbelief. And Jesus touched Thomas in a way that he helped his unbelief. And so Thomas proudly fell down to the floor on his knees and said, My Lord and my God. When did Jesus touch you? Because when Jesus touched me the first time, I was a cultic person. I thought that, you know, our past sins were forgiven, but we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling so that, you know, when Jesus comes, I'm going to be glorified. So I was trying to work out my own salvation, but Jesus forgave me of all my sins already, past, present, and future. And I cried when I realized that on the bus. Good thing people were not looking at me. <laughs> but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So when we read the scriptures, let's remember, this is all for us, so that we, we may believe in Him. And if there is any unbelief in our hearts, God wants to touch that. And when we gather together, where two or three are gathered, Jesus said, I'm going to be there in there, your midst. And just know that when we're gathered together, Jesus is going to walk in. And He's going to touch someone's life. Could be yours. Could be someone else's. Like yesterday, it was someone else's. But I got touched too. Because, wow, He showed me things that I never imagined would happen in the open hearts of him. Things that I never thought my sister would ask. The one who's Catholic. Just be there. And expect that Jesus is going to walk in.